today I'm going to talk to you. Thank you, by the way, for having me uh, to give this talk to your lab and your group. I'm excited to share with you a little bit of a journey over approximately a decade of work, uh, sort of the hinted at the title, a journey from fundamental neural circuitry to cognitive control systems. Um, so I'll try to keep things, you know, within the, you know, approximate 50 minute range the best I can. Um, and I might speed through some things or skip over it just so that we have time for discussion. Um, just a little bit about my group, the Neural Adaptive Computing Laboratory, or the NAC Lab. Uh, our primary mission is to create biomimetic learning algorithms and computational architectures, and we are often inspired and motivated by theories of cognition and biological circuitry. And I have here in the bullet points a bunch of different uh, legs or branches of work that we work on. Um, the primary ones of interest, of course, are going to be uh, predictive processing or predictive coding, and sometimes prospective coding, depending on what parts you're working on. Uh, active inference with a focus on neurorobotics um, and spiking neural nets and a bunch of other things. Um, we do also care a lot about catastrophic forgetting and developing uh, biological mechanisms or brain-inspired mechanisms to try to reduce uh, that type of problem in machine learning. And then to the bottom right, I mean, at the bottom, I have my some of my sponsors, but uh, funding sources, but we like to tout, sorry for a shameless plug, our soft, open source software package, NGC Learn, uh, and you know, you're free to go look that up at any time. It's on GitHub, and you can build your own predictive coding and neurobiological systems, uh, you know, if you will, if you're interested. Um, and we're also looking for open source and open community contributions. And then, of course, no lab, uh, as June and anyone else would uh, agree, is nothing without their students. And so I've had the pleasure to work with many great people. And of course, I have at the very top uh, my four current PhD students. Uh, obviously, they're listed in order as they appear in their names. Will, to the left, works on spiking nets. Uh, George Yang, who's actually currently doing uh, an internship at Meta, works on active inference. And Viet looking quite uh, introspective and plotting his next active inference free energy model is uh, there. And then, of course, uh, to the far right is one of our newer members, Faiza. And then we also have uh, in the middle one of my current uh, master students who's working on spiking nets, Daniel Fishbein. And then our uh, very bright uh, undergraduate honors thesis researcher, Chanel Sheng, who's uh, actually now currently doing some work at MIT on spiky nets, as I talked with June a little bit about before. And of course, can't forget to mention some of my key collaborators. Um, not an ex exhaustive list, but of course, you might recognize a few names. Uh, and I, yes, I have, I am working with Carl, Chris Buckley, and Rajesh Rao, Ben Gertzold. So a couple of uh, really nice names, uh, you know, that, you know, carry a lot of years of experience to learn from. So let's get into the talk, enough about the lab. And uh, uh, basically the overview is I'm going to talk a brief bit about the recent excitement about deep neural nets. Uh, June and I were having a conversation a bit earlier about uh, his journey with backpropagation and now that's all the rage these days, uh, especially now with the era of large scale language models and transformers. Then I'm gonna talk a bit about Neural generative coding, which is a specific form of predictive coding that I've worked on for quite a while. Then I'm going to talk about, uh, at a lower level, how to generalize this a little bit uh, to spike trains and how to get uh, the same predictive coding model to sort of work with discrete communication values. And then I'm going to jump back up a level and talk about large scale systems that you can build with literal predictive coding circuitry. So cognitive control systems. And if time permits, I mean, I might have to speed through the end. Uh, I'll also talk about some of my most recent work on uh, another type of biologically plausible learning called forward only. You might have heard of forward forward algorithm by Jeff. I've done a lot of work also in parallel and recently since uh, his algorithm came out and how that might relate to predictive coding and spike trains. Um, so, of course, this should look familiar to many of you. It's a deep neural network uh, with many multiple, with many layers of processing units. However, if we inspect more closely any one particular unit in this network, we'll see that it is essentially a pointwise neuron that takes in a linear weighted linear combination of uh, input features or feature detector values from a level below. We sum them together and run them through a typical cost function. Yes, I am just showing a fully connected network. You could obviously 
put convolution and kernels in between these. Uh, and, you know, if you take inspiration from like models like the Neocognitron and other classical models to build vision based architectures. Um, but this is kind of the typical design pattern of a lot of modern day networks. However, you might say, aren't neural artificial neural networks brain inspired? And you could argue yes to an extremely coarse grain degree. Um, obviously, to the top left above the diagonal line, I have a, an anatomical, a cartoonified anatomical diagram of a neuron with more details of its actual components and actual parts that actually lead to the dynamics that we observe from a neuroscience point of view in our actual brain. And then, of course, to the bottom right is, again, that same point-wise neuron. And you might begin to notice that while you might see a few words that are sort of crudely approximated by the point-wise dynamics, it is a far cry from what actual neurons do. And a particular element of my long-term research is trying to bring back some level of granularity of what actual neurons do in terms of computation and information processing and bringing them back into the world of things like machine learning to show that we could do better generalization or maybe generalize differently from a cognitive point of view. So again, of course, there are many, many differences between these. I'm not gonna go at length explaining everything, but one big one that will be at some point in the talk, we'll talk a little bit about that a lot of deep learning is sort of like an approximate rate coding kind of way of doing calculations. And we would really like if we want to add some biological fidelity and actually energy efficiency by looking to spike trains. And of course that makes things more difficult and we'll have to talk a little bit about how that works. Now, of course, when you're training your, you know, typical run-of-the-mill deep neural network to do some type of function approximation, you are using essentially backpropagation of errors, or in other words, reverse mode differentiation, or the chain rule of calculus from a vector a linear algebraic point of view. And the idea is that we're going to have some type of cost function at some output layer. Let's pretend we're doing like regression. You have a cost function, you take derivatives of it, and you essentially pass back derivatives along the weights that you use to do your forward transformation, and you adjust your synapses according to the chain rule. And of course, this is also known as credit assignment, more from a general machine learning point of view, where we're trying to play the blame game. We blame neurons for how bad they do, and we give credit to ones that do a good job. And the idea is that credit assignment is about developing algorithms whatever way you draw your inspiration to adjust the synapses or parameters. Of course, I'm showing in diagram form at the bottom right, three of the most common problems. They are not by far all of the problems that exist with backpropagation. Um, weight transport's kind of more of a biological issue where we reuse the forward, uh, the forward synaptic matrices to actually calculate teaching signals to go back along the network. Um, but, you know, maybe you're okay with that, but other problems are forward locking. We can't naturally or easily parallelize the layer-wise activations of a deep neural network. You can kind of hack it, um, but then you have to do a lot of things to get around the issues of backpropagation to work properly. So it's not very easy to do parallel computation, whereas in the brain, we know that this parallel computation tends to come quite naturally. And of course, the update locking problem is I can't update the weights, let's say, at the very bottom layer until I finish percolating the derivatives of the cost function across each layer until I reach the very bottom. So this is also strictly a sequential process. Unless you hack it, it's very difficult to get this to work. Um, of course, this isn't the first time. It's nothing new to criticize backprop. Even Francis Crick, uh, as early as 1989, and Roseberg before or around that time, sort of had a good paper about the criticism about the recent excitement about neural networks. And you'll notice one of my bullet points was paying homage to that particular paper. Uh, I just also want to point out that if you want to train something more powerful, like a recurrent neural network, you have to do something that I would argue is even worse in terms of biological plausibility. You have to effectively unroll or unfold the recursive relation that defines your network over a time window. And if we were to think about what that means in our brain, that would mean that we have a time machine and we are copying instances of our actual brain, stitching them together and creating one super deep feed forward network to do the chain rule of calculus. And of course, that's probably not what's really going on uh, with real biological circuitry. So we're gonna talk about what to do if you're not going to unroll. 
Now, of course, backprop is just one type of algorithm, even if it is the most and absolutely top most used algorithm today for deep learning. Um, so, you know, we can put it here in a little corner. Uh, this title of this slide is a uh, little bit uh, uh, inspired by a comment that Terence Sejanowski, who gave a talk at RIT many years ago, and I got the pleasure to chat with him, said that he believes that there's a galaxy of credit assignment algorithms that exist, and we are only scratching the surface of what they are. And in my own research over the last many years, that, that is indeed a true statement. So let's say you don't want to do backprop, you might start to question, what can you do? Um, another algorithm, and I hope everyone can kind of sort of see my uh, slide. I'm going to try to uh, hide. There we go. So hopefully you can see that. Uh, you'll have feedback alignment, which essentially is just back propagation, except we resolve the weight transport problem by replacing the forward weights with a random matrix that is approximately shaped to be the same size as the transpose of the forward weights. And we just do backprop like normal, but with those as the backward pass. Um, and that does resolve one criticism of backprop, um, but it also has its own issues as it is also very unstable train. And then of course we have some work that was done by my uh, team and myself many, many years ago called local representation alignment, uh, which gives a little bit more biological plausibility to backprop like learning. Um, now, instead we are taking some ideas from predictive coding, uh, and combining it with a local gradient that we then adjust the synaptic, sorry, the neural activities of every layer, create a target, and then we essentially train layers in a local way. Uh, so that gives you some type of parallelism to try to adapt to these locally generated targets. Um, and there's some recent work where we generalized it to be a little more parallel and recursive. Um, it might also remind you of something called target propagation, came from uh, Yashua's group, uh, many, many years ago as well. And there's also new versions of it, like difference target propagation. Um, although Jeff, uh, whom I know, and uh, Randall O'Reilly had generalizations of a target prop as early as recirculation, which is another type of algorithm where we were essentially building autoencoders, but we're doing autoencoders to do the credit assignment process. Um, they're very nice and they have some interesting things they resolve about backprop, um, but they too have their own unique issues. I'm not going to go into all those issues. That could be a talk in of itself. Um, and then, of course, I do want to make some completeness. This is not by far an exhaustive <laughs> list of all the possible algorithms that have existed over time, um, but we also have competitive heavy and learning uh, from Grossberg's group, Kohanen. Uh, you might have heard of self-organizing maps and competitive heavy and learning from Martinez's early work. And then, of course, we can't forget contrastive heavy and learning. Some of you might be familiar with contrastive divergence and the weight sleep algorithm, which were used to train harmoniums or uh, Boltzmann machines uh, as early before even when we were trying to use simulated annealing to do that. Uh, that came from Jeff's uh, work and as well as some more recent versions. Yashua's group uh, sort of came out with something called equilibrium propagation which is essentially a form of contrastive heavy and learning, but with some other nice dynamics and connections to spike timing dependent plasticity. So already right there, a lot of algorithms. We're not gonna talk about any of them. Uh, again, I encourage you to read some of my work uh, as I do often compare to different algorithms at different times and highlight their issues. But this sort of gets you a picture of the journey that I want to take. And my lab and my students by proxy go along with me for the ride, and it is a bumpy ride. Uh, and the idea is that our work is influenced heavily by uh, statistical learning, but also I also by training a uh, cognitive scientist. One of my co-advisors was a cognitive psychologist, um, and also heavily influenced by computational neuroscience. So our work is very interdisciplinary and sort of lives quite squarely in between all three of these domains. And as I said, our mission is to find credit assignment procedures that are robust and work differently than backpropagation, uh, resolving its core practical limitations, as well as resolving some of the neurobiological criticisms um, with the hope that we'll generalize differently. And of course, you know already that I have a particular bone to pick with backpropagation through time with recurrent neural nets. We don't want any explicit time machines. And of course, another uh, branch of my work that I'll mention a little bit in my talk is trying to figure out uh, the grand challenge of catastrophic forgetting, which despite all the work that exists today, we are very far from solving that problem, at least from my perspective. Um, something else you might be wondering besides 
where does predictive coding fit on this? Don't worry, I promise I'm just about to get there. Um, but uh, besides thinking about uh, biological algorithms such as predictive coding to do complex tasks, uh, you might start to wonder throughout this talk, how much neurobiological detail do we want? Maybe you're convinced that a deep neural network isn't really quite what the brain does, but do we really need to go hardcore neuroscience and try to model every single detail? Um, and again, a lot of this work sort of lives at, you know, if you know Mars' levels, Mars level two approximately. Um, but I do have an answer for this question. I'll give it to you right now, and then we will see in this talk how I begin to tackle it. Um, none other than Albert Einstein gave us the answer to this question, even though he didn't work on brain-motivated credit assignment. Everything should be made as simple as possible, but no simpler. So the idea is that we don't necessarily want to model every single detail, but we want to model as much as we think we might need to get that generalization right. However, this is a quite difficult answer, uh, and it's not as simple as it might sound at, at the surface. So just to give you sort of a roadmap, uh, obviously, you don't have to worry about if you can't read certain words, I will make sure that I'm explaining them and pointing to things. So uh, we're going to see these diagrams several times. Uh, this talk sort of has got a roadmap. Obviously, at the very top lives cognitive architectures and cognitive control systems, uh, the, which is one mission of my work, which is to build things that emulate the unified model of, co or sorry, the common model of cognition uh, by John Laird and Andrea Stocco and others. Again, that's my cognitive scientist speaking. Um, and I am also an affiliate uh, and uh, professor in psychology and affiliate faculty in computational neuroscience. So I have to wear a couple different hats. Um, along the way, there are little subsystems that we can build cognitive agents or control systems that are, you know, again, all of these are using biological uh, forms of learning. There is no back propagation. We usually just use backprop as our straw man and show, you know, what it can't do and its limitations. And of course, I'm going to start the talk actually in the middle. I'm going to talk to you about the predictive coding work I've been doing that sort of like formulates a core foundation of everything you're about to see. And then, of course, uh, I will also talk about how that can be generalized to spike trains a little bit briefly, but, you know, we can always have more discussion about that some other time. So let's just dive right into the predictive coding. Um, again, the middle part, we know that uh, there at least one particular theory about cortical function is that it's known as predictive processing. And the idea is that neurons in our brain try to generate hypotheses, and they correct these hypotheses based on sensory data. And this can kind of be generalized at all sorts of levels. Predictive coding can be very broad. It can go from a psychological level and a cognitive level, as Jun mentioned, that part of his interests lie in. Uh, you can also go down all the way to fine grain dynamics and talk about how neurons really operate and do credit assignment from this kind of simple idea. Um, and of course, though, if we're going to do uh, hypothesis adjustment, we're going to also need to develop some type of passage, message passing scheme. Um, obviously, I've been committed to the free energy principle and variational free energy, so you can kind of uh, keep that in mind if you know about Carl, Carl's work, uh, obviously, on free energy. Um, I also draw a lot of inspiration from Bruno Hausen's classical work on sparse coding uh, and a lot of old work in the 80s and 90s about like iterative thresholding and classical models that kind of recover models of receptive fields uh, of literal actual cells in your uh, cortical structure. Uh, and so the idea is that we want sparsity. Sparsity is very, very important, especially if you want to work with neuromorphic hardware, uh, which is one interest in my lab. And that's why we develop some of the algorithms we do that sort of put sparsity sort of near the top of what we actually care in our representations. And of course, as I mentioned, things are being, you know, ultimately we are minimizing or optimizing free energy or an approximation of it. Uh, if some of you might be familiar with my work or will eventually read it, uh, you'll notice I sometimes call mine total discrepancy or TOD, Todd. Uh, that's just essentially an approximation of free energy, and I do mention that in my papers. It's sort of like a sum of distance functions, but you could look at it as any kind of energy function, and free energy works as well as an interpretation. And a lot of the other interest in my work is contributing to uh, an advancing active inference, but from a neurobiological process viewpoint. Uh, so again, you can do active inference with backprop, but a lot of my work focuses on how can we use predictive coding and bend it to do active inference. And of course, that diagram is a reference to uh, Rajesh Rao's classical work, who I read a lot of when I was a grad student, if you couldn't already guess. 
Um, so of course, this journey starts, I, I will show you some snippets of papers of mine that I think are representative and key uh, for you to, you know, glance at and get more, a lot more detail uh, along this journey. Obviously, my dissertation uh, started with predictive coding as well. But believe it or not, my first model that I ever fell in love with was a Harmonium or the Boltzmann machine and uh, and Hopfield network. So I sort of started from there and developed some very early uh, alternative algorithms for training Boltzmann machines for semi-supervised learning, and then sort of bumped my way into predictive coding and fell in love with uh, its particular processing scheme and found its flaws that I wanted to work on. And of course, this is a very recent work at the bottom. Uh, it's in nature, but you can read it. There's actually an early preprint that came out right about the time that the pandemic was beginning, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so, but it, it was an interesting time and an interesting bit of work. And actually it forms a lot of the basis of what you'll see right now. So again, don't worry if you see a lot of words. I know that some of my text is a little bit dense, uh, but the idea is essentially that neural generative coding or NGC is just a predictive coding computational framework, but it is a particular generalization. It's actually an interesting type of framework that resolves some other problems with back, uh, sorry, not just back propagation, but with predictive coding uh, as it was typically formulated by Rao and Ballard in the 90s. Um, but the idea is that, again, if we think about our network, I'm gonna actually show you a little animation to walk you through the dynamics more carefully, but the idea is that each neuron or layer or region of neurons emit a projection or a top-down expectation. And of course, we're going to use sensory evidence, you know, sort of pulling on our Bayesian hats to do a form of bottom-up error correction. Of course, a lot of NGC focuses on adding things like lateral excitation and inhibition. So neurons interact with each other within a layer to induce sparsity. As I promised you, the idea is to find sparse representations, especially kind of like sparse coding, but not impose cryptotic distributions over the latent space. And then another key component, which you know Carl would certainly approve of, which is uh, error precision modulation or error precision weighting. Uh, again, also adding lateral interactions in something called an error neuron, which are quite simple to understand. Uh, any predictive coding, NGC or BCDIM, if you know Michael Spratling's work or Rajesh Rao's model or Carl's models, have essentially two types of neurons that we're committing to. They are usually called state nodes or state units. And we also have another neuron that essentially is called an error unit or an error neuron or an error node. And these neurons are fairly simple in most computational implementations. They just do error calculation. They are doing mismatch uh, prediction, sorry, mismatch calculations that we can then use to do heavy and updates, um, which is a really, really nice attractive feature of uh, predictive coding in general. Um, and NGC sort of takes that and runs with it and says, well, why can't we build arbitrary uh, non-hierarchical circuits just like those that exist in the brain? Um, obviously, if you've read Douglas Hofstetter's work or, you know, Herbert Simon, some very classical artificial intelligence research and machine learning work, um, the idea is that maybe things aren't hierarchical, but rather heterarchical, where we sort of have partially decomposable hierarchies and connections kind of skip across layers. Things are very recurrent. Obviously, I'm sort of implying strange loops, because I also know Jun mentioned he's interested in consciousness, um, but I'm not here to claim that I have solved the strange loop problem, or that I am a strange loop, or that my circuits are per se. Um, but there is a little bit of that inspiration in sort of the arbitrary design. The other part I want to sort of briefly emphasize is that you can map these particular computational neurons to real neurons that at least we know exist in the brain. Uh, these error neurons are often equivocated uh, in Carl's work and many others to uh, superficial pyramidal cells. Um, and then of course the state neurons themselves are approximately equivalent to the functionality of deep excitatory pyramidal cells. Um, and then sometimes we refer to the synaptic projections from let's say a, a deep excitatory pyramidal cell as a generative synapse, but they are called other things in the literature. And then the nice thing about NGC is it also tries to make clear that we want the weight transport problem resolved fundamentally, uh, since the brain typically does that. And so we don't necessarily reuse connections to back propagate in any way, even locally, our signals. So the idea is that we have these separate synapses called error feedback. 
Uh, and these are also learned and trained locally. And the idea is that they are, uh, you know, doing sort of that message passing that I mentioned to you earlier. And you can show an objective function. I'm not going to walk you through the derivations just because I don't have all the time in the world. Uh, and I don't want to keep you here too long. Um, but again, you can sort of show yourself that it's approximately minimizing an online form of variational free energy. And you can calculate the heavy enough updates themselves. I will show you the dynamics. Um, but again, please refer to some of the work that I've done and uh, we can have a longer chat or you know offline chat about some of the other mathematical properties. So again, just to show you some dynamics as I promised, uh, if we just think of any arbitrary layer L, I will walk you through briefly what these equations intuitively mean. Don't worry about the symbols. Again, it's, for example, in the nature paper, I define all of these uh, very concretely. Um, but any particular layer of neurons at, let's say, L plus one, those are those state neurons or those uh, superficial, sorry, those deep pyramidal cells that I explained, they will essentially emit through a weight matrix W, uh, a projection. And you can ignore this term. This just allows you to do uh, skip connections. Uh, and it kind of breaks the hierarchy and you know works quite well for generative models, at least in my lab's experience. Um, but the idea is that these neurons emit a Z bar, which is essentially a vector of expectations or the mean of a multivariate Gaussian distribution, if you want to think about this as a Gaussian hierarchical process model. Um, and of course, I told you that there are error neurons. So the error neurons are essentially a represented in most predictive coding circuitry as a subtraction. So the idea in element-wise subtraction is we're going to take that uh, expectation vector and we are going to subtract it from a target. And what is this target? Well, it's easy. It's the, another layer of nearby neurons that have their own activity values. So basically, now you get the idea that these local predictions are one layer of neurons, try to guess the activity of another layer of neurons, and this will become more concrete in the little animation I will step us through. And of course, I'm not going to talk too long about it, but you also have a precision matrix. Uh, yes, that is an inversion. And yes, I do a lot of things to approximate that inversion. Um, but fortunately, and as I've discussed with Carl, and you know, there's work from Raphael Bolkatz's work about doing other approximations, you can sort of decouple the error neurons and do some recurrent stuff. Um, but for now, let's just assume that you can use like the Morse Penrose pseudo, pseudo inverse function, or maybe a Woodbury matrix approximation to do some type of uh, matrix inversion calculation. We do want that if you want the true multivariate co Gaussian model uh, with a full covariance matrix. Um, you can also turn it off and set it to the identity and you recover actually Rao and Ballard's classical 1999 model as uh, my work also demonstrated in uh, 20 last year. And of course, the bottom equation is very interesting to me. Don't worry again about all the terms. I'm not going to bore you with all those details, um, but it is set up specifically and not quite typically like a lot of predictive coding you see today as an Euler integration scheme, which is essentially what the dynamics of the neurons uh, the state neurons specifically at any layer really are. So of course you can have an integration time constant, which kind of control how far you take a step in the neural dynamics. And the bottom one is a membrane time constant or just the time constant in a rate coded model. And this is sort of what allows you to control the time scale and scale out how you actually adjust the synaptic activities. And if we look at what's inside the parentheses, because we know that we're gonna calculate some update, and change the current vector to get our next time step. The idea is we have a leak, and I do have the annotations for you. Um, so again, like I told you, the top is an expectation. We have our precision weighted expectation mis mismatch signals. Then we have inside our dynamics a leak, and this is just to mem uh, model the fact that neuron uh, neuronal membranes leak voltage. Um, of course, this is a rate coded scheme, so we actually scale that factor, whereas in our spiking network, we sort of like set that to one. We also have a top down expectation, which in classical predictive coding and even NGC, it's really easy. You just take the error weight, uh, sorry, the error vector or the error neurons at a layer, and you just multiply by a negative one. And you have essentially, if you work out the derivatives, the local derivatives of the free energy, you will find that it's just essentially the flipped version of the weighted precision errors. And then, of course, the really important term, which is our bottom error, uh, bottom up correction term, is just essentially a projection of the error of the layer that you're at. And essentially we sort of 
transmit that error message along another set of synaptic matrices E. And yes, these are learned with Hebbian rules. You could turn them off and learn them with random. And if you want to recover Rao and Ballard's model in 1999, you can set it to the transpose of the generative weights, which, you know, if you don't care about the biology uh, and you're more interested in saving memory, you could do that and this would work just fine. F of D is just a dampening function. Uh, because we're not going to necessarily adhere to the chain rule of calculus. It's just a dampening function that you could set to the identity, um, but you can also do some interesting things to uh, create the approximate derivatives, and it can just helps with the dynamics. And then this last term, I'm not going to dwell too long in. I do recommend reading the Nature paper last year, where we talk about how we can also modify the dynamics to have uh, uh, self-excitation and cross-lateral inhibition. And this is essentially a sparsity-inducing structural function, uh, which is not very typical or actually not used at all in most predictive coding. Uh, and so this was a very nice term that got us extreme sparsity uh, in our deep uh, systems that we were actually training. And now, mind you, these are just the dynamics. What I've explained to you right now is just about how the activity values of the neurons at any layer change with time. This doesn't tell you anything about learning. All I've talked about is iterative inference. And yes, you are going to have to simulate these equations through many steps in time because the idea is that our brains or our cortical structures process data over a time window, uh, usually over a period of milliseconds. And so we want to emulate that in some sort of way. By the way, this bottom equation, really, really useful as a bridge towards getting to spiking dynamics because we're only a few extra steps away and we can now model membrane potentials a lot more cleanly. Um, and at the very top is just a diagram taken from the uh, paper of last year. It was a really, really nice treatment just to show you the exact cellular structure. And you can see where the full precision matrices values sort of play a role there, sort of like multiplicative uh, adjustments or gating variables, and you could argue that they are a compartment in the neuron. And a lot of MGC and the even the software that our lab, uh, my lab has developed, uh, talks about neurons from a cable theory point of view and a compartmental neuronal theory point of view. So we have a lot of theoretical commitments that uh, we've attached ourselves, hence the computational neuroscience angle of my lab. Now, I promised you a little uh, di interactive diagram. Um, so I'm going to try to go through this a little quickly. Let's just pretend we're going to clamp the very top to a vector just because you could do it without it. Um, but, it, you know, to understand the cognitive control systems, I'm going to mention a bit later, uh, you clamp an input to the very top. And obviously the other neural activities are initialized to, let's say, zero, but you could initialize them to a resting potential value or a uh, tuning curve. And the very, very bottom is clamped to your target. And that doesn't do anything interesting until we actually run this system iteratively over a time window. So, of course, uh, again, in one time step, each neural layer emits a prediction. So that's that expectation I told you using the generative synapses. You can see Z1 bar. By the way, notice that things are happening in parallel. So what layer one does, it does it in parallel of layer two. You don't need to wait for your feed forward propagation pathway like you do in typical deep learning. So we get our expectation. Our error neurons can activate immediately because they can compare the expectation with the actual activation value. And now you have an error signal. Uh, and of course, what we'll do next is after we calculate this error signal in parallel for each layer, we will now backwards transmit it, but I just want to point out here, these are the equations that you might have seen earlier. I'm omitting the precision matrix for simplicity, but I, here it is. I put it back in. I promise you, you can use that as well. Um, and the idea is then once we have these error signals, we will backpropagate. Since I clamped the very top layer, I don't need error synapses to the very, very top because that value is predetermined. We are deciding that we want an input-output mapping. If you didn't, you would have to learn that layer. And so basically the idea is you'd have more synapses to wire up there. And of course, now that we have this projection, we can take the negative of the error of every layer and combine it with the back, uh, sort of uh, message pass signal from the layer below, and we adjust our signals. Now we have just done one time step of inference in our model. And of course, you know, just to show you a little bit of that equation earlier, you do model the state update using the top-down prediction. I've moved it over here to the right. We use our little dampening function here. I did use the derivative, first derivative of the activation function, but you could turn it off because especially if you want to do spike-based communication, uh, derivatives are a little annoying. And we have our leak, and beta contains delta t divided by tau. 
And of course, we modify our update, and I'm just using Z caret as an intermediate variable to promise you that we are not necessarily deleting variables, but we're rather overriding them in memory to think about the von Neumann architecture of our computer. And so now we've done one step of inference. You're going to do this multiple times. Uh, after you do an override, you keep overriding the steps and you go back to step one, as I showed you. Repeat the cycle k times or big T times. Uh, in uh, a lot of my work, you don't need too many of these steps, but if you're doing like spiking nets, you need more fine-grained dynamics. So you're going to obviously want to emulate 100 milliseconds, and you know, depending on your Euler integral, it might be a little more complex. But to also tell you the story of learning, it's very easy. Learning naturally happens inside this particular scheme because of those error neurons. Let's say you run your model for a window of t steps. You can actually use Hebbian learning or a multi-factor Hebbian rule that essentially just takes the product of the current activity of a layer. And obviously you have access to your activation function if you use one and you do a matrix vector multiplication with the error neuron that corresponds to that local layer. And you have a Hebbian update. Um, I do this circle with a dot is the Hadamard product or element wise multiplication. So you can do that with matrices and vectors. Um, and we multiply it by a synaptic scaling matrix I'm not going to talk about detail about that, but that's an interesting term that sort of does uh, sort of neural weight, sorry, synaptic scaling, uh, another known biological property that just helps with stability. You can, you don't have to use it, and a lot of predictive coding circuitry doesn't, including my own. Um, and of course, those error weights are essentially, you could view them as the transpose, their rule is like the transpose version of delta W. It's another heavy and update. Uh, with their own synaptic scaling. However, this little gamma E is just a time constant that we set to something uh, small. So you can actually have the error weights adjust themselves or the error synapses adjust themselves on a slower time scale. And yes, you do have to update those precision weight matrices. And if you do so, you're going to have to obviously make sure you redo your matrix inversion um, but hopefully you'll use an approximation uh, and then it doesn't get to be too bad for, let's say, most dimensionalities. Um, but that can be a particular problem and you'll need to look to biological alternatives to implement that. Um, but anyway, that's pretty much it. That's predictive coding. And a lot of my work says that you can do lots of different things. You can build arbitrary structures. They do not need to be hierarchical, which is really nice for those that are designing sort of arbitrary deep networks. Um, and you just sort of want to train them in a biological fashion. Um, and I am going to show you very briefly, although I think I'm starting to run out of time. This talk always is top heavy and starts here. And, you know, then I go through the results a little more quickly than I'd like. Um, but the idea is you can build things that work with time. You can build arbitrary hierarchies, multimodal models, and so on and so forth. So, again, just to promise you that these are generative models, you can sample from them. There's a top-down directed generative model that the predictive coding essentially emulates. Um, so I developed some sampling algorithms to actually acquire uh, what those are and estimate some approximate bound on the log likelihood because the, the log of P of X is intractable for these as well, but you can do some Monte Carlo approximations to get them. Um, but the samples are very easy. You just use ancestral sampling um, and you can you know, train MNIST digits. You can train kanji characters. You can train, for example, M, uh, fashion MNISH, you can train objects from Caltech. Obviously, I looked at a lot of black and white images, but yes, you can do natural images, and I will show you briefly how to do that. Um, we did some work to analyze what was learned in the structure, and we found that a lot of the layers learn, for the bottom most layers learn like a super weighted superposition of features, which is really, really nice. These are actual samples taken from uh, some of my earlier work. Um, but the layers that are above it, or the deeper control layers in a top-down model, learn what I would call a command structure, a latent command structure, where neurons have these particular sparsity patterns that turn on neurons in a particular layer. And this is sort of how the weighting coefficients of a particular feature, feature pattern are sort of computed. Um, that's where the, the depth seems to be going inside a deep predictive coding circuit. Um, this was for a fully connected structure. Obviously, the results are a little bit different uh, for convolution. Along the way, I do want to briefly mention that problem of time machines and backpropagation through time. So some of my earlier work uh, actually looked at predictive coding fundamentally as a time varying system, which they are, uh, even though we use them a lot nowadays for static data. And so some of my earlier work says, does the brain unroll itself in time? 
Those of you that are here at this talk probably know my answer to this question. No, like a big no. Um, unless some of you are cognitive scientists and you want to argue that unfolding mathematically might not be what the brain does, but it's an approximation or a simulation of some type of memory. Fine, we can debate the, the philosophy of it, um, but it's not likely that the brain copies itself in time. Our brains, our head, brains kind of stay in our head um, and do local adaptation. So you might ask yourself, well, how do I train this, uh, you know, without backpropagation through time? There's a lot of alternatives, um, but often online updating is a bug rather than a central feature. These algorithms don't really get at the biological learning. They may have their own problems too, like echo state networks. You fix most of the weights. Um, so of course the answer is do what I've been doing, minimize total discrepancy, or as I told you, approximate variational free energy. And the idea is that we're going to do uh, error correction in local heavy and updates, very much like what I've already shown you. The rules look very similar. Um, the only difference is now you have to start inducing some type of recurrent memory. You don't need to unroll it, but you do need to sort of track a little bit about this error correction scheme. Um, so I'm showing bouncing MNIST, which is a particular benchmark used. Uh, we came up with a model called the Parallel Temporal Neural Coding Network. Um, you basically do mostly what I've explained, except now you have a little kind of working memory that these neurons sort of maintain, and this recurrent memory matrix is adjusted at each layer. Um, but again, it can be adjusted through heavy and learning. You can also draw connections to common filters, like Rajesh Rao did in the 90s as well. I drew some inspiration from that as well. It's sort of like a common filter, but not quite, uh, because common filters make other assumptions. This is a very, very nonlinear system. Um, and of course, just to show you some numbers, I'm not going to explain everything. We compare to a lot of backpropagation and non-backpropagation models. We did bouncing VMNIS, bouncing not MNIS, which was a uh, my colleague and I came up with just an alternative benchmark. We also did some language modeling. I've worked on language modeling, uh, even with my friend Thomas Mikolov in the early days before Transformers. And of course, we did a lot of, I did a lot of comparisons to like bouncing balls, which is one of my favorite generative modeling problems. Um, and of course, we also showed nice things like if you train a temporal neural coding network, which is just our predictive coding scheme, and you train it on something like three balls, and then of course you uh, give it two balls, it was never trained on this, it generalizes fairly well to out of distribution data, or at least data that really doesn't seem anything related. The IID assumption starts to break down when you start to change the dynamics a bit. Um, and we were doing a little bit better than, for example, backpropagation train networks, which was a nice small early result. Um, and that was our temporal neural coding. So here's a little video of a fully connected model. It is learned, these are the fantasies of the model as it predicts the future. Um, it's not given this data per se, but it is a little grainy. It isn't perfect. Um, but I promise you, you can do a better job if you generalize to natural images. And so just to show you some other fantasies of some work that's about to come out this summer, I promise you it will. Um, the model, the bouncing ball fantasies over time are actually quite nice. They're a lot more crisp. They're not perfect. There's always room to improve um, as everything in machine learning and computational neuroscience. But um, this, this is a pretty satisfying little result. Um, if we start to look at inductive biases that allow us to bring in, for example, uh, convolutional priors. And again, we're not going to break our learning rules. Um, you can do things like zero shot prediction and continual learning in the time varying domain. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to dwell on it too long right now because I'm already probably grossly over time. Um, but I do want to show you that you can to generate those bouncing ball videos or even work with natural videos, you can just take the exact same thing I explained to you and learn a little bit about deconvolution and we'll develop a heavy and update for those particular kernels. And you can tr basically treat each layer as a set of state maps rather than state neurons. And the idea is these little grids try to make a convoluted prediction or a deconvoluted predict projection of another layer. And then we have grids of error neurons that essentially are doing like feature map mismatch prediction. And the idea is that I'll just show you the dynamics right now very briefly. Um, again, that diagram to the right is uh, our work published at CogSci of last, uh, this year recently. And the idea is that you can do prediction, but here we're going to use the convolutional operator. So now you're going to have to start dealing with feature maps. 
Um, but this inductive bias proves to be really useful, and you can start working away from convolutional kernels by using locally connected structures if you really want to adhere to cortical type of maps. Um, but the idea is that their mismatch signal is very simple. It's just a subtractive neuron. Um, we don't emulate the dynamics, at least in this work, uh, in some fine-grained way. Uh, and obviously, there's no precision matrix just because we're working with very high-dimensional data. Um, and of course, our state dynamics look very similar as they were earlier, uh, but we do them per feature map. Um, and of course, we have our bottom up and top down, so our bottom up signal, which is again, we use convolution to go backwards. So deconf to do prediction and convolution to go backwards. And Carl told me when I was presenting this to him several times to emphasize that it's an interesting idea that the smoothing process by deconvolution turns out to be so powerful, um, just to promise you, you know, that things work. Obviously, you can even do for free denoising. And we didn't really train our model to do denoising. Um, obviously, if you train a denoising convolutional autoencoder, that's going to do better because it's only doing that. Um, but you do get, you know, somewhat denoised images. They're not perfect, um, but it's a kind of a nice side effect. Um, the other thing we looked at is that implicitly, a deconvolutional neural generative coding structure actually learns implicitly an image pyramid, which, you know, we didn't add any inductive bias to get it to learn that per se, just the, the convolutional weight sharing property. And you get for free this kind of image pyramid that's implicitly constructed in the model. I thought that was particularly really neat. Um, but uh, the CogSci reviewers actually really liked our result on out of domain samples. Um, the really nice thing is that uh, convolutional generative coding actually works really, really well, too, on data it wasn't trained on. So we did a fun little set of experiments where we took, like, a model that was only trained to do reconstruction or generative modeling on SVHM and then applied it to CIFAR-10, which we never gave it the training data from there. Um, and we were pretty good, actually. We, you know, autoencoders can, interestingly enough, do these types of weird reconstructions. But because of the iterative processing nature of convolutional neural generative coding, we do much better in terms of across a bunch of metrics, notably SSIM, which is like a visual perceptual quality metric, peak signal to noise ratio, and of course, our mean squared error in your standard metrics. Okay, um, uh, very briefly, you can also take the things I've just taught you about what we do, and you can generalize them to spike trains. So we're going to go down a level very briefly. I promise I won't stay here too long and get to the cognitive control, and that way we can wrap up the talk. Uh, June, I do apologize if I am going over, but you know I'll just try to get through this. Um, so this actually is now no longer to appear. It actually has already been published in neurocomputing. Uh, you can use this title to find this work. Uh, this was something where I generalized the notion of predictive coding, uh, and it's among one of the earliest ones, aside from Rajesh Rao's and uh, Dana Ballard's uh, model in 2001, uh, which kind of is like a probability model. The idea is that we can take those neural dynamics I showed you earlier and start to look at real biological neurons from a leaky integrating fire point of view. Yes, this is arguably one of the simplest biological models. You could use my framework for Hodgen Huxley. Uh, or Ichkovich neurons. There's nothing about the framework when you read the paper. It's very general. So the idea is you can plug and play different types of biological neurons. Obviously, some are more expensive to simulate than others. So we went with the uh, leaky integrator, the LIF. And the idea is, like I told you earlier, cells uh, are enclosed by, or their particular organs are enclosed by a membrane, which receives a positive electrical current, I of T, which increases the electrical charge inside a cell. And of course, this cell membrane, you could view it from an electrical engineering point of view, acts like a capacitor in parallel with a resistor. Arguably, it is a very simple circuit, an RC circuit, um, but this is in line with a battery of a potential of U rest. I actually call it V rest for voltage, but you can, a lot of computational neuro neuroscientists use the variable U. Um, and again, the zoomed in set sort of corresponds roughly with what I'm talking about. Um, and the idea is that the cell membrane reacts to electrical current. It builds up a voltage membrane potential up until a threshold that you have to define. I do actually purposely represent it as a bold vector because you can have a threshold per neuron, like another little compartment, and the voltage reaches that threshold. And once it breaches it, it fires. And what does it fire? An action potential. And in this case, we're going to emit a binary spike. So now we are no longer communicating with real values like I was even doing earlier. We are now in the discrete land, uh, which is perfect for real analog hardware, for neuromorphic chips, 
the idea is that these spikes now allow you to sum weights. And a lot of things are zero. Zero, and many of you have uh, an, uh, an engineering background of some form, you know that zeros are perfect for hardware because it means you don't do anything. Um, so we don't need to calculate zero times something or zero anything. Um, so the idea is that these spikes are emitted across many layers. That gives you kind of what spiking networks are in a very crash course kind of way. I'm omitting a lot of details for sake of time. But the idea is that that predictive coding framework I've been developing with you guys can be generalized to spike trains. Because we don't require activation derivatives, I just had a dampening function that I told you is not even really all that needed unless you really care about certain dynamics. Um, you can use spike emission functions, which is my name for spike models. I didn't want to use spike response because that's actually a computational neuroscience term for kernels. Um, so we use spike functions. And just the idea is that the dynamics I showed you earlier, please read the journal article for like the exact gory details of how to do this. Um, but you know, you can just now treat every layer, state layer, as voltage. And that's why I showed you the integration time constant, because now we can take the electrical current, which is just a projection of one layer's prediction to another, weighted by a resistance value that you decide. Um, and then, of course, we have our leak, which I told you earlier was just essentially leakage from the membrane potential. You could set this constant to a one and get rid of a coefficient. And of course, we'll do our Euler integration. I'm not showing you. I'm just showing you the partial, uh, the ordinary differential equation. Um, but again, you would compare that voltage at every time step to a voltage vector and get a spike output. And yes, you can make these adaptive and you can do all the fun stuff in uh, computational neuroscience to get that real fine grained neural uh, dynamics. Um, at the very bottom is actually a diagram taken from the journal article. At the very top is uh, of electrical current uh, over a voltage over a spike raster slot. Um, and the idea is that this is just tracking two particular neurons of a trained uh, spiking predictive coding model. We call it spiking neural coding. Um, and the idea is that every layer of neurons now, you got to start thinking of them as spike vectors. And we also introduce another important variable uh, called a trace variable. I'm not going to talk too much about that either. It's just another ordinary differential equation that allows us to integrate spikes over time to give us a real valued signal. Um, this helps when we're doing error neuron calculation. As you notice, the green diamonds in this diagram compare the, the calculation of this trace, which you could argue comes from like calcium concentrations in neuronal cells, and it compares it to an expectation that was emitted from the layer above. The expectations can also themselves be spike patterns or spike trains as well. Um, and we compare them to a uh, in, uh, Poisson spike train encoded input. Um, again, a lot of details are buried in all that terminology, but I promise you uh, the journal article really goes into detail. There's a very, very long appendix too, with even more details and algorithmic depictions if you're interested in the structure. NGC Learn also can emulate this, which is really nice. Obviously, we use that to do all our development. Just to promise you that we also looked at continual learning with my belief was if you go to the spike level, you have extreme sparsity, so there's less crosstalk among the neurons. Um, you do have to do some other things. You can't just use the spike patterns by themselves do give you some immunity, but they don't solve the problem. You need to introduce some lateral competition that's induced by context, or you maybe introduce like a little episodic memory to induce some type of replay buffer. And you can get some really, really nice competitive scores. We're almost as competitive as some of the state of the art. Even GDUM is a backpropagation model. Um, and I mean, there's so many models these days, I might still now be obsolete, but this was one of the more recent ones uh, that reviewers wanted us to do a comparison with. So we have GDUM in there. Um, just to look at the generative samples, you can get some samples from that spike uh, of the predictive coding model. And, you see them there at the very bottom. Um, so now for the final part, and again, I am- So, so is it Alex? Uh, yeah. Could you wrap up uh, in the, the yeah, findings I'll, or something? Yes. Yeah, okay, five, five minutes, I'm gonna blaze through this last part. Yeah. So I've shown you how to do predictive coding at a rate coded level, at a spike level. Now I'm just gonna basically whet your appetite. I am going to basically skip over a big chunk right now about how you can build cognitive architectures with it. Um, but there's a lot of good work that I recommend. And I can also give these slides to you, June, and you know you can share them with the team for those that wanna like actually read the papers um, if there's interest. 
Um, the idea, though, is that in uh, NeurIPS of last year, we also took, for example, we built a little tiny cognitive system where we took a predictive coding circuit and we introduced another neural circuit that was inspired by the basal ganglia on the brain. And this basal ganglia model does information routing. And the idea is that it induces sparsity that's task dependent. So basically, it's like a control system that uses actually, funny enough, nothing with predictive coding, it uses competitive learning. Uh, it's just, you know, inspired by adaptive resonance theory. And this model essentially learns dynamically just to basically switch task, um, but it'll control the cortical circuit and turn off and turn on neurons depending on what task you're doing. So if you're predicting ones and twos, you don't want to lose that information when you're predicting two, threes and fours. That's catastrophic forgetting. And a lot of neural nets still succumb to that. The basal ganglia interaction, we create a complementary system, and this kind of works really nicely. Um, but again, it too has its issues, um, but it does uh, work pretty well on a bunch of different benchmarks. Um, just look at the very bottom. We have very high average accuracy and very low BWT, which is a metric for forgetting. Um, again, this part I'm going to just briefly go through. I presented this work recently at ICRA. Um, and earlier work was at AAAI of last year, presented virtually. Um, this is, again, we can build a control system inspired by active inference. And active inference just wants you to do two things. For those that might be familiar, you need to balance a goal-oriented signal or like a reward, if you want to call it that. Um, but it can be more general, like a distribution or an encoding function or imitation learned policy. And you have to explore it with something called epistemic origin, which is an exploration term that allows you to explore an environment in a more intelligent way. So we basically, and this is the more recent version called active predictive coding, not to be confused with RAL's version, which is APC, and it kind of does something a little bit different. It's not active inference. This is literally an implementation of active inference with predictive coding that I've taught you at the beginning of this talk. You need a prior, you need a generative model, uh, a world model specifically, and then you need a motor action kind of cortex-like model. And that's what's going on in here. I do actually step you through uh, how this system works, but for sake of time, I'm not. Just promise you that it does actually work. And with a little tiny bit of imitation data, you can train a predictive coding circuit prior, and then you plug that into our cognitive control system, and you get some pretty neat things. Um, I'm just going to show you, I mean, the numbers, obviously, we beat out a lot of reinforcement learning and imitation learning baselines. I'm just going to show you robots that are in RoboSuite, the Stanford Physics Simulator. The left is a random poly, uh, um, the model at the beginning of training, and, you know, it learns to refine it over time. I do want to point out a limitation that we do work a lot with Markov decision processes. Uh, but POMDPs or partially observable MDPs are way more interesting, which means we really got to learn from pixels. Um, and you might think that that's pretty hard, but I have some very, very recent work that isn't yet published, but I promise you it will come out on archive soon, uh, where you can take that convolutional model I told you and do some other cool things to make it temporal. And you can learn, you know, to predict in RoboMimic. This is, by the way, very high fidelity, you know, physics data. I'm not working, unfortunately, with a real robot, which is sort of my dream. Um, but the idea is that you can learn a pretty good quality generative model to do planning and other nice things in an active inference framework. And Carl, Chris, and I will have this out very soon. Um, again, I'm going to very quickly just mention to you that you can build cognitive architectures with it. If you're interested, maybe I could do a different talk or, you know, talk to some of you uh, at a different time. Um, so I'm not, I'm really going to just skip over this. There, you can do some wonderful things with holographic memory. I'm just going to show you this cool brain picture um, and show you that you can build modules like the basal ganglia system, a planner, a world model, and put all these parts together. And you can solve, for example, maze tasks. And I just have a little video to promise you that it works. I'm not going to show you uh, some of this work. I'm just going to mention that you can do things that aren't quite predictive coding. Um, very recent work as of this year, uh, sort of me and Jeff, you know, I haven't worked with him, but, you know, in parallel, we've been doing forward forward learning. I'm not going to walk you through the dynamics, but I will give you a promise that you can combine predictive coding with contrastive learning. And this is not contrastive predictive coding for those of you that do backprop based stuff. This is literally predictive coding generative modeling, and you can kind of do local heavy and updates. Um, this is in a paper that, again, it's the predictive forward forward algorithm, and we have even code released online for you to play with if you would like to play with this type of model. Um, 
I will give one more shameless plug. You can actually take that model and my extremely recent work generalizes it to spike trains. Um, the one of the first works ever to do forward forward learning uh, in contrastive learning very specifically uh, in a biologically faithful fashion with spikes. Um, if you actually want to hear more about this, there's a lot of fun dynamics. Uh, I'm actually going to present this to uh, Intel's uh, Neuromorphic Research Community uh, Workshop, which is July 20th through 21st, and you can apparently register for it. So if you want to hear about this specifically, that's my algorithm, contrastive signal dependent plasticity. Obviously, you know I'm inspired by STDP. Um, so it's a really, really beautiful framework, and it allows you to also do predictive coding like things. So, I mean, there's numbers and pretty pictures that I promise you show you that it works better than, of course, even some algorithms for training uh, uh, spiking nets currently. Um, again, my last shameless plug is NGC Learn. Uh, you can go visit this link here if you're interested. And again, I'll even share these slides with June for those that maybe want to build their own predictive coding models and even reproduce some historical models. Like I have Rao's model, Friston's model, uh, Olhausen's model, even uh, Lillicraft's spiking network is in there and Hinton's harmoniums. You can reproduce a lot of famous things in the model museum part of this library. I really love this. Uh, feature and it's something my lab actively develops, but we also welcome community contributions. It's currently in TensorFlow, but we're rewriting it in JAX. It'll be even more flexible. Um, and this is for doing hardcore simulation stuff. So you really want to build vectorized, at least GPU uh, ready type of biological models. It's a lot better than using things like Brian, which are beautiful for neuroscience, but they don't scale very well. You're not going to be able to do like reinforcement learning tasks, which you can do with NGC Learn. Um, again, I'm not going to read to you all this text. I just want to mention that we went on a journey together uh, a little bit fast there. I apologize for going a bit over time, um, but we basically walked our way from backpropagation based deep learning to a predictive coding framework that works really well for all types of things down to the spike level and back upwards to cognitive architectures. Um, obviously, read those papers if you're interested in seeing like how you actually can build a common model of cognition implementation about it. And then, of course, I did briefly tease you uh, with forward forward learning um, and how predictive coding might be something that's inside that framework. And uh, you can do really cool things with that. And I'm not going to dwell on here, but just kind of wrap up the talk now, as I you know promised June, um, that again, that level of biological realism, we're not modeling everything. There's a lot of things that neurons and synaptics and dendrites do in the brain that we don't quite do. Um, and we only introduce those mechanisms when we have some type of justification that they might do something important from either an energy efficient point of view, a sparsity inducing view, or some type of generalization that we don't think you're going to get with point-wise neurons and background. You can keep using backprop, obviously transformers use them, um, but if you're looking to a neuroscience oriented neurobiological type of thing, uh, predictive coding is obviously one of the best candidates out there. And my lab has done a lot of work. We also work with Carl and Chris and Tomaso and a bunch of others, uh, sort of like unifying all these different pieces of free energy. Um, and this is a diagram that I made uh, specifically for the nature paper. Um, you can just see, so, you know, processing the digit six, um, and obviously, it's just one little tiny circuit in your brain, and it's minimizing for you. And that is it. I will stop there. And, uh, you know, if we have any time for questions or comments, feel free. Thank you. Yeah, Alex, thank you very much. Very great talk. I, I personally very much interested, especially about the continual learning regarding network without unrolling. So, but uh, many other parts also very interesting, exciting. So then, but uh, I'm, I'm going to, yeah, ask the audience. So are there any question discussion, please? Uh, yeah, please. Yeah. Yeah. Next question, can you hear me? Yes, please ask, yeah. Henry. Yes, well, thank you for the amazing presentation, Professor Lorimi. It was very, very insightful. Um, I thought it was very interesting, the idea of bringing back the neurodynamics in these architectures. And did you consider modeling other important neurodynamics, such as accommodation, and neuron fatigue, for example. Mm -hmm. Are you asking, have we considered that? Or did you consider doing that? Yes. So <clears throat> obviously in the, the, the models I've presented to you so far, uh, they don't really model that specifically, but you can model, for example, fatigue, like uh, something that we were doing in the more recent spiking versions of this model 
is like, for example, if you have like a relative refractory period, or you can model things like hysterosis in the cells, the idea is you just modify those voltage dynamics. You can actually get things like the adaptive threshold is a very easy way to say that if a neuron spikes, it should be harder for that neuron to spike again in the immediate future. So this uh, this helps control things like burstiness, where you get like a lot of spikes in a small period of time. So neurons should fatigue. Um, so we have modeled that to some degree. Obviously, there's a lot to the story that we don't omit, or sorry, that we have omitted, because, you know, again, that also starts to add a little bulk to the computational simulation. Um, I think the value in going even further is, especially if you want to do things like at the neuromorphic level, or you want to work with analog technology, which is kind of a concept I've been working on from a biomimetic point of view. You want to do things like very mortally uh, uh, grounded types of computation where things have to worry about survival. Uh, I think the fatigue really comes into play. And that also helps get some of that efficiency and you get sort of like that self-organization of neurons saying, hey, uh, this is starting to tire out. Maybe I'm going to take over that type of computation. Um, so we have a little bit of that modeling, but there's a lot missing in our picture. I'll leave it at that. Okay, thank, thank you. you so Are much. there any questions? Okay, so I have my, my question. So that is, uh, yeah, I basically, so you, you talk a little bit too quick, but there's uh, what I got is that, so each layer, so you put some kind of target neuron, and also target neurons are updated by using the errors, error generated in the previous layer to somehow, yeah, yeah you, you can update this target thing. So that is, I understand in terms of the hierarchical perceptual neuron or convolution neural network. Yes, yes, you, you can do that. So that that's uh, uh, very good. So then, but I, I'm kind of lost. When mm -hmm. you, so I, I think you are using same idea to the recurrent network, but uh, without unrolling, that's part is uh, I have a little bit missed. Could you go back to the slide? Of that sure. So you want to go back to the recurrent uh, network, current model, without sure. the unloading. Yep, yep, yep. I know it when you want. Yeah, they go back. It's pretty far back. Uh, oh, let's come on. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's gonna be here. Yeah, around there. Right. Yeah, this model. So this one. So yeah. Yep. So, and then this one is, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so this model, if you're, yeah. you know, since you said you were a little bit lost, I mean, mm -hmm. a general idea of any predictive coding type of thing is we do local prediction. So the best way to think about this specific model mm -hmm. is look at two time steps, because again, backprop unrolls over many time steps. Mm -hmm. So we are at time step T and we just look at the second layer. These mm -hmm. are those neurons that I developed earlier in the talk, mm -hmm. these neurons are recurrent. So they'll all they need is just like a little temporary knowledge of what their activity was at T minus one, right? Mm -hmm. You know, a recurrent neural network mm -hmm. when it's folded, right? So these neurons say, okay, given my last activity, I project that into my new state mm -hmm. and project downward. Mm -hmm. And I just guess what is the activity of layer one at time T? Now, remember, layer one at time T is also recurrently connected to its previous activation at T minus one. You only need T minus one. The idea is we are not going to unroll this run full, mm -hmm. get a big graph, right? Mm -hmm. Now, that's it. So if we just look at layer one and layer two, layer two tries to guess layer one. Yeah, yeah, and then yeah, yeah. Okay. And it represents the yeah. error between. Yeah. Okay. Them. And then my uh, my question is that uh, can you extract a long time correlation in this way? Well, I mean, you can to some degree. Some uh, degree. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's not perfect. Okay. I'm right? sorry. Yeah. Be because in the Erman network, all the days, they don't unroll. Right. But still, they can get somehow a little bit, but weaker, but in some degree, they can get the temporal correlation. So in that exactly. way, so this one can get some temporal yep. correlation, but uh, maybe not so strong like LSTM, right? Probably. Right. And yeah. that opens up a different door. If you want this to pick up stronger correlation, mm. for example, when you're projecting over a hori longer horizon in the mm. future, 
Uh, this is what I was showing you that will come out later, uh, bouncing balls. But I also showed you those robot arms where I showed you. Mm -hmm. That's where you have to take the neural dynamics and you have to take inspiration from those gated architectures. You don't unroll. Well, I never unroll my systems. Mm -hmm. Okay. You add these little gating compartments and that gives you like a working memory. That allows you to do longer time scales. So if you just ah, okay, make, okay. So it's a, lot makes memory. Okay. a little complicated, uh -huh. you get more, so, you get it's better correlation. This paper, it's written, is it written in this paper, right? Kogusai 2013. Uh, no, not that though. The, the temporal thing is about to come out because Carl about come out. Okay. <laughs> it hasn't come out yet, but I promise you, and I will, you yeah, know, yeah, okay, wait. very yeah. soon because yeah. these results are from it, okay. but it's just not public yet. Yeah, so I understand it quite so. Okay, so then and are there any questions by some other? Can anybody hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes, Sergio. Uh, uh, quickly, is there a reason why you don't use equilibrium propagation? And is your, is, does your approach have any particular benefits over equilibrium propagation? Oh, big time. Um, yeah, no equilibrium propagation. So as I mentioned very fast at the beginning of the talk, it's sort of like a form of contrasted heavy and learning, um, but you can kind of equip to spike timing. The, the thing about e equilibrium propagation, just like contrasted heavy and learning, is it has like a positive or a negative phase and then a positive or a negative phase that are chained together. So the biggest problem I have with equilibrium propagation, there are like two problems. One you can kind of resolve is you have to use the, uh, it doesn't resolve naturally the weight transport problem. You need to have symmetric connect, bidirectional connections, kind of like a Boltzmann machine. There was a paper that showed you can do random transforms, but it was never really followed up on. So I, I think the jury is still out about some of the biological commitments you have to make. But the bigger criticism that I do mention in some of my work is when you do contrastive heavy and learning, which is like what approximately equilibrium propagation is, you do a, you, you say, I'm going to clamp, let's say, the input and I clamp a target. Let's say if you have a label, you run it for so many time steps and usually have to run for a bit. And then you say, I'm going to unclamp it and I'm going to run it for uh, until I reach convergence or an equilibrium point. Right. And then once you have those two phases, when you reach a fixed point, you do contrastive rules or you can do like a subtraction. And the idea is it's basically a positive uh, heavy and update and an anti heavy and update. And you just basically contrast those two together. It looks a lot like contrastive divergence. So that's great. It's it's a really cool algorithm. I've seen people do things like uh, Hava Siegelman in terms of neuromorphic computing. However, it's very expensive, especially that relaxation phase where you think leave things unclamped. People have done amortized inference, but even that still makes it very expensive and complicated. Predictive coding, especially like the frameworks that I've been, been developing, it's at best, or let's say at worst, like half of equilibrium propagation. You don't need these two phases that are conditioned on each other. You just need one iterative phase. You are just processing one time step, uh, sorry, one particular data point or a time varying data point over one window. So if you kind of want to draw an analog, it's kind of like you cut equilibrium propagation in half and you're doing only a positive phase or a negative phase. And then you just do a heavy and update, which comes from those error neurons. Because if you don't have those error neurons, obviously you don't have a target. And then I very, very quickly, shamelessly plugged my forward, forward only kind of working uh, algorithm that you can also view as like eh, equilibrium propagation, but the phases are in parallel. And so the problem with that is you have this conditioning that's really complex and you need to do that because progressive heavy and learning requires you to say, I want to, uh, let's say, lower my energy function for fantasies that are garbage and raise the, or sorry, lower the energy for data points and raise the energy for garbage or whatever direction you're flipping it. So it's extremely expensive to do that, even with approximations. Predictive coding is way faster. Um, it's not as fast as backprop, but it's much better than like, and we do some comparisons like early work. My last comment, I know I'm taking a little too long, Sergio, is uh, also we have found empirically that also equilibrium propagation, at least in its original form is quite unstable for fairly deep networks. So this was in my other really early work with local representation alignment. You train really deep and thin networks. Um, didn't work very well. I mean, it works like for three layers, but if you start going up to like six, you know, and cortical hierarchies are approximately five to six layers, 
you get weird issues and it's very, very difficult to keep it stable. That was a more of an empirical issue rather than it in, you know, we verified our implementation. But the biggest criticism I have is those condition phases. And it's very expensive to reach fixed points because you kind of need that for the theory of equilibrium propagation to say, we're going to get a valid actual, let's say a gradient and how to equivocate that back to spike timing dependent plasticity, which is what Yashua did in some of his work to say, you kind of recover it, but only at equilibrium. That's, okay. that's so, yeah. Make sense? Uh, yeah, I I quite agree that it's, uh, that it's kind of weird to have these two phases. Well, yeah. well some people like Randy O'Reilly really embrace, embrace the idea, but I, me not so much. Uh, but probably the trade-off is that you are assuming a very particular neural motif that you need in order to implement this. Uh, but if if it close to what you would observe in the brain, yeah. So again, you are right that you know nothing comes for. There's no free lunch, even in biological algorithms. So you do commit yourself to certain biological mechanisms. Like again, these error neurons are like fundamental. Like without them. You don't get that uh, message passing scheme, but they come naturally from the variational free energy derivation. Um, the only thing about uh, equilibrium, and again, I know Randall O'Reilly's work on like generalized recirculation and gene rec, right? You know, all of his al his algorithms, especially in the early days. Um, there's some nice things that those things do, but again, it's just those neural dynamics are very expensive, and you're constantly having to run that alternative phase. So again, I do think that there's some compatibility between them. And there was some work I remember reading. It's only, it was only an archive, a guy named Baron Millage uh, also showed some equivalences that you can kind of get equilibrium propagation from the framework of free energy and predictive coding. And you can sort of see that it's sort of doing some form of that learning. Um, but again, the dynamics are different enough that you're actually learning something faster. Uh, and again, you might be learning a different type of generative model. I'm not saying, by the way, that equilibrium propagation is should be just dismissed. I think there's some interesting ideas in there. Um, but again, for me, from a computational modeling point of view, I'm already paying the price of, let's say, if you're doing linear algebra, more matrix computations to emulate a time window. Um, and so it, it, there is an advantage that you reach your fixed point in the iterative inference scheme of, let's say, a predictive coding free energy model a lot faster. And again, I am giving you anecdotal experimental information. I'm not saying definitively, um, but again, a lot of the equilibrium propagation work, even from Yashua's group, they try to do something like amortized inference. And that, again, also makes things complicated because you have to learn a good inference recognition network, which can compromise the quality of your generative model and you make other assumptions and you can make assumptions to try to make it faster. Um, but I see a lot of like, it's sort of like, a, my opinion is like a lot of duct tape that they're trying to say, let me try to massage the algorithm to make it more appealing. Um, again, I do think it's an interesting idea, um, but contrastive heavy and learning when you were just even wanting to train hop field networks is also very interesting too. I do love the fixed point dynamics of like memories being stored at an energy well, um, but you know, that inference scheme is really, really expensive. So that's where I tend to prefer the, and argue that these models are gonna be a lot easier to also look at implementing them on neuromorphic computing than requiring these phases and, you know, trying to make sure that they're coordinated. But I do think forward-forward learning, uh, last point, um, and I'll stop blabbing, is the forward-forward learning approach and like the stuff that I was doing uh, kind of gives you the benefit of what you might think that you're getting from the, the contrastiveness of what's going on in equilibrium. It's just that I never liked the chain of the negative phase followed by the positive phase or the negative phase before the positive. I do love them. <laughs> and you can get now contrastive learning for free in a biological framework. So I do recommend checking out like forward forward learning if you don't already know about it and my predictive forward forward learning, which kind of gives you that best of all those worlds. Um, yeah. Does that make sense? Thank you. Yes, yes, thank you. Okay, okay. So, so now is 11.30, so we did 90 minutes already. So so probably we're going to finish. If you, yeah, but uh, very exciting. So, so I like to read about your article. Also, please send me the your slide. Yep. We try to publish it in, uh, in uh, YouTube with pointer to this slide. So yeah, we Perfect. do it. Okay.
So thank you very much. And I hope yeah, to thank see you for you having me somewhere in the future. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I had a lot yeah. of fun. I hope you guys got something from the talk. It was an honor to give it to you. And thank you for having me, uh, June and everyone. Yes, here. yes. Great. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.